Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am the Omniviewer, and today we're revisiting the Lost World Jurassic Park to discuss something I've seen come up in regards to its themes. There are many people who have seen this film and come away from it feeling that, by accident or design, the film winds up endorsing eco-terrorism. After Team Hammond witnesses Team Ludlow capturing the dinosaurs to exploit them on the mainland, it is revealed that Nick Van Owen isn't just an adventurous photographer, but actually part of an environmentalist group known for its dangerous methods in preventing the destruction of the planet. It is he who leads the charge to free the captured dinosaurs, who then proceed to run roughshod over Team Ludlow's camp, ultimately causing lots of death and destruction. This can be viewed as a form of eco-terrorism. Now, I have seen it argued that Nick Van Owen is indeed intended to be an eco-terrorist, but that doesn't necessarily mean the movie thinks he's right. The argument states that Nick is supposed to be a foil to the hunter Roland Tembo, and together they form a sort of yin-yang counter to each other. Both are entrenched in their worldviews, both carry a sense of authority, and both are on opposing sides literally and sociologically. Yet of the two, Roland is surprisingly a better person than Nick, despite being on the side of the antagonists. Ergo, it is asserted that this introduces a splash of grey into the film, as opposed to painting things strictly in black and white. There is meant to be a sense of moral ambiguity surrounding the two teams on Site B. Interesting theory, I admit. It might even have been the intent. But I don't necessarily think the Lost World succeeds in conveying that notion. You see, in order for a work to truly be morally gray, it needs to present two sides of a particular argument on more or less equal terms. As much as possible, the author must refrain from tipping the scales too far to one side or the other, thus allowing the audience to make up its own mind as to which side is ultimately right. That's not easy to do, you have to understand that. Even the best authors can sometimes show their hand too early. And I think showing the hand too early, or at the very least, not getting the point across, is exactly what happens in the Lost World Jurassic Park. First and foremost, consider how much time we spend with each team on Site B. From the beginning, the audience is with Team Hammond. We know each and every member, we know why they are here as a group and individually, and we see how they get along. Or don't, in some cases. Why in the hell? Yeah. Uh, doesn't this thing ever work? You know, it's not a landline. On the other hand, we don't spend nearly as much time with Team Ludlow. The team is incredibly large, but we only get to know a few of its members. We know Peter Ludlow himself, who is framed from the very start as the villain. There's no question that we aren't supposed to like him, since he stripped his kindly old uncle of his power and ruined Ian Malcolm's career. He's also the butt of a few jokes made at the expense of his masculinity. Even Lex and Tim don't like Ludlow, and they're related to him. We also get to know Roland Tembo, the last of a dying breed. He is a hunter, yes, but a noble hunter, the kind from an age when hunting for sport was still considered a gentlemanly pursuit. He actually would have been right at home in the original Lost World. Roland doesn't hunt because he is an evil, nature-hating monster, but rather because he ascribes to an older way of thinking, and he is so sincere about it that we understand him. He knows what he's doing, and he doesn't hold grudges even when you go out of your way to get on his bad side, as shown by the way he helps the very saboteurs who wrecked his camp. Roland is good people. The rest of Team Ludlow, however, doesn't get that much development. Ajay is portrayed as a decent guy, but that's mostly by way of associating with Roland. There's not much to him beyond that relationship. Dieter Stark is portrayed as a sadistic scumbag who tortures small animals and is always looking to pick a fight. We are meant to believe that he gets what he deserves when the copies attack him. Then there's this paleontologist guy whose name I honestly don't remember, and he's just there for exposition. We never learn anything about him beyond his profession, and thus we aren't given much of a reason to care when he bites the big one. Or rather, when the big one bites him. Everyone else on Team Ludlow just kind of blends together. These are the impersonal characters, just this side of being faceless, disposable stormtroopers. We aren't able to connect with them, nor are we expected to. Heck, the only time we see them actively doing stuff is during the big hunt. Speaking of which, this scene in particular really kills any chance the Lost World had at being morally ambiguous. Let's settle here for a moment and look at how this whole sequence is presented to us. During the hunt itself, the camera is always at eye level with Team Ludlow. 
We are on equal footing with them the whole time as they are chasing and capturing dinosaurs. When we cut to Team Hammond, though, things change. Team Hammond is on a cliff above Team Ludlow, allowing them to look down at the hunt. When we see their reactions, the camera is slightly lower than eye level, emphasizing the fact that the characters are looking down. The camera gets even lower as we see them, as if bowing submissively. Simultaneously, the music becomes very somber, dare I say, judgmental. The intent is clear. Team Hammond, who literally has the high ground, are looking down at those who do not respect nature, and we in the audience are among those being judged. That doesn't seem very morally gray to me. This movie knows exactly whose side it's on. But what about the finale, I hear you ask, for this is where the movie has one last shot at introducing some gray morality. Nick Van Owen, in one last bid to flip the bird at Team Ludlow, removes the bullets from Roland Tembo's gun. I have no idea when he would have had the opportunity to do that, but he did it at some point, and in doing it, he believes he's robbed Roland of his chance to kill the bull T-Rex. Roland, however, is not one to give up easily, so he settles for using the tranquilizer rifle Team Hammond had brought along. He doesn't kill the T-Rex, but he does bring it down, thus setting the stage for the San Diego attack. There is a brief moment as Team Hammond leaves Site B where Nick glances down from the helicopter, sees the T-Rex being prepared for transport, and slumps down in his chair. It has been said that this is Nick realizing he messed up and his methods are only going to make matters worse. Furthermore, it can be said that the finale is traced directly back to this moment and the San Diego attack can thus be pinned on Nick's actions. I disagree. I do not think this was the intent of the movie because, as we're about to see, there is no evidence that Nick Van Owen is being held at fault. After this brief moment where Nick sees the T-Rex being packed up for delivery and he conveys all the disappointment of finding out his bread burned in the toaster, he vanishes. Nick Van Owen is not in the movie from that point forward. Now you could say this is an act of cowardice, since he ran off with his tail tucked between his legs instead of sticking around to help clean up the mess he made. But it would only be you saying it, because the film doesn't say it. Not only is Nick physically absent from San Diego, he's not even mentioned. You would think him pulling a Pontius Pilate and washing his hands of the matter would at least earn a sarcastic quip from me and Malcolm, but his role in causing the attack is never brought up. It's as though he had no part in the proceedings at all. By this total absence, Nick Van Owen is thus absolved of all guilt. But this is a Jurassic Park movie. The entire series is all about how people think they have control over things they don't, only to learn the hard way that playing with matches is a great way to burn the house down. So somebody has to be at fault for this. The question is, who? Well, we could blame Roland Tembo, seeing as how he's the guy who actually shot the T-Rex, but we clearly aren't supposed to do that either. He too is absent from the finale, but he has some passive-aggressive parting words for Peter Ludlow before he leaves. I believe I've spent enough time in the company of death. This line makes it clear that Roland knows bringing the T-Rex to the mainland is a bad idea, and he wants no part of it, so he's getting out while the getting's good, and nothing that happens after this point will fall on his head. So even though he had a more direct hand in securing the T-Rex than Nick did, Roland also winds up being absolved of guilt. So the movie doesn't think Nick is to blame, nor does it think Roland is to blame. Who does that leave us? Well. It leaves us with the man we've been encouraged to hate from the very beginning. Now you're John Hammond. Yes, with that single line, it is made clear that Peter Ludlow is the only person at fault. No blame falls on the environmentalist whose passion informs questionable methods, nor does it fall on the hunter determined to catch his prey no matter what. The blame for everything that happens in the film rests squarely on the shoulders of Peter Ludlow. This is all his fault, and it is karma when the baby T-Rex slaughters him. I realize this might feel like a bit of an anticlimax, seeing as how I just went through all this trouble only to conclude that the villain was the villain the whole time. But that conclusion makes it very difficult to justify the Lost World Jurassic Park as a morally gray film. It might look gray from a distance, but once you get closer, you realize it's not actually gray, it's just a bunch of black and white pieces that got mixed into a jumble. 
Moral ambiguity may have been the intent, I will concede that, but it's not what was executed. Whether this was a result of the choice to change the ending, or if it would have existed regardless, I don't know. I only know how it played out in the end. Until such time as we meet again, this is the Omniviewer, signing off. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it, as well as subscribe to the channel for more content of a similar nature. Also, check the description for links to our Twitter, DeviantArt, and Patreon pages, as well as the Amazon link for the novel Operation Red Dragon The Daikaiju Wars Part 1, penned by yours truly. Thank you all, and we appreciate your support.